I want to welcome everyone who's joining us from all around the world for this event, a Davos Agenda event. I know we're not in the snowy mountaintop town in Switzerland, but uh, we bring the spirit of that event today to all of you, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, we're looking forward to really having a dynamic conversation on what to me is maybe the most important topic in the world today, which is what the future is going to look like where most people live uh, in the world. And of course, we are going to have this conversation about fragility, about low-income countries and how they bounce back, how they build back better uh, with a dynamic panel of people, many names I think known to those of you who are joining us from around the world. But again, a warm welcome if you're joining us on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter, wherever you're seeing this live stream, or if you're a member of the World Economic Forum, uh, we at DevX are just delighted to co-host this with the forum and bring it to you during Davos Agenda Week. I'm Raj Kumar. I'm the president and editor-in-chief of DevX. And uh, as you know, if you follow our coverage at DevX, these are topics we talk about all the time. We've been interviewing leaders around the world on how we come out of the pandemic crisis we're in now, which is having different effects on different countries and different people. In fact, I'll just uh, mention to, to our panelists, I know you, you know this well, it's hard to think back a year when all of this started around the world, but there was an idea at the very beginning when it became clear this pandemic was going to be a, a true pandemic, it was going to be global, we thought it was going to be the great equalizer, right? It would affect everyone. And we learned quickly it did affect everyone, but not in the same ways at all. And we saw the massive inequalities within our societies, and we see them between countries between nations around the world. Uh, and that's what we're here to talk about today is to think about what are the opportunities coming out of this pandemic to bounce back, to build more resilient societies that are maybe currently very fragile, that face real dire consequences as a result of the pandemic. And we've got a, an incredible group of people to help us have that discussion today. I wanna to welcome all of them. Borge Brende is of course the president of the World Economic Forum, a man with probably quite a busy agenda this week. Thank you for taking time to be with us, Borge. We have Peter Maurer, who is the president of the International Committee for the Red Cross. Um, again, someone well known to all of you who are in the humanitarian sector and a frequent face uh, in, the, in the Davos Agenda Week and, and across the World Economic Forum's events. Catherine Garrett Cox, who is the CEO of the Gulf International Bank and someone who's worked a lot on global finance. And we're gonna get into that topic a lot today in the event. And Arunma Ote, who's an academic scholar at Oxford University, but maybe best known to all of you uh, for her long career at the African Development Bank and the World Bank, where she was uh, a vice president and treasurer. And so we're going to be thinking about many questions around how fragile and low-income countries build out of the situation that we're in now, from the financing standpoint, from the international organizations and structures, the way the humanitarian system works. We're really going to tackle this at a high level, and I'm just delighted to have this incredible group to have that conversation with us today. Um, Borgia, maybe I can just begin with you. Uh, you know, the, the forum is famous for having put out this idea of the Great Reset. And of course, it's, it's a challenging concept and it's challenging a lot of advanced societies with a lot of resources. You see you know, the richest countries in the world doing massive fiscal spending and trying to find ways maybe to connect that to climate goals or to equality goals. Uh, to build resilience in their own societies. But what does the Great Reset mean to you when you think about it in the most fragile context in the world today? It, uh, we have a clear obligation also to make sure uh, that the poorer countries, the developing countries, also have a real chance uh, to revive growth, uh, more inclusive, uh, job creating growth and uh, you're right we're not there if you look at the massive stimulus that uh, the developed countries have now launched 12 trillion us dollars that has been building a bridge uh, between economy that was growing uh, to economy that has been contracting a lot last year so you could furlough people you could also let businesses then um, have a break but they can come back again out of the 12 trillion US dollars in stimulus, only 1% was used in the poor countries. So what we have done uh, in the industrialized countries is to do whatever it takes to fight uh, this pandemic, also the economic um, outcome of the and result of the pandemic. What the developing countries have done is that they have done whatever they have 
And that was not a lot because many of them did not have that fiscal muscle. So what we have to make sure now is that uh, we don't end up with uh, vaccine nationalism where everyone uh, in uh, the developed world get vaccinated and then that's not happening in uh, the poor part of the world. And my last point is that that also shows us in many ways how much we are in the same boat uh, in the sense that if we get um, everyone vaccinated in um, the developed world, it's also going to hit very badly if the developing countries don't get uh, access to this vaccine because it's going to mutate and then it's going to come back and it's going to bite you with a different variant. And then uh, you have to adjust the vaccine or maybe you have to have a new vaccine. Maybe everyone has to be vaccinated every fall, like with the flu. So we have to get everyone globally vaccinated. It's a question of justice. It's also a question of solidarity. Yeah, and, and the truth is we are seeing that reality play out right before our eyes with, vac with, with virus mutation and also with the long delays, it looks like, the big gaps between the wealthiest societies getting access to the vaccine and when we expect it to come for lower income societies. We're seeing it play out in real time. It's a very visceral thing when you think about for yourself or your family getting that shot. And then you imagine our colleagues and friends in other parts of the world that we talk to, and it seems like it's nowhere near on the horizon for them to get it. Uh, Arunma, let me get you into the discussion too. You know, I'd love your just high level thought about the, the structure that we're in. You worked in the multilateral development bank space for a long time and countries are, as, as Borge mentioned, you know, they're, they're strained now and many of them maybe ha weren't hit so hard by the pandemic itself. The health consequences might've been lesser in some places, uh, but the economic consequences have been pretty universal on tourism, on you know, commodity exports, how do you see the, the opportunity or the way forward for some of these fragile economies in the world today? Um, but Raj, maybe I just have to start by thanking you and Berger, uh, DevEx and WEF for uh, putting this event on the agenda. Um, ordinarily, I don't think there's enough attention that's being given uh, to fragile conflict and uh, violence affected areas. But when people are focused internally uh, they're not even paying attention. And of course, women uh, and young people are, are probably the most vulnerable, even in those populations. Uh, and as Berger mentioned, you know, the world is borderless. Uh, if people didn't know it before, now they know it, given what has happened uh, with the pandemic. But I'm also always very optimistic. So I think that there is the opportunity. Uh, and the opportunity is that private sector investors want to want to be involved. I mean, if you've got 200 million, 200, sorry, 200 trillion dollars of private wealth um, that's looking for where to invest, um, I will say that the opportunities exist in many of these fragile, conflicted uh, and affected areas. Uh, and if you're putting, uh, if, you know, as many banks said last year, people, 25% uh, of the global debt uh, is earning negative yields then you're actually paying some people to hold your money. Uh, so it is the time for us to think about this opportunity that these um, uh, areas uh, represent for us. So for me, um, the Great Reset, um, you know, as someone who um, uh, experienced war uh, in Nigeria from 1967 to 1970, um, um, I think people just want to be able to survive. They want to be able to eat um, at least one meal a day. I wouldn't even venture to say three square meals a day. They want to be able to send their children to school. They want to avoid uh, insecurity and violence. Um, they want a home um, and they want an identity. They want the world to know that they exist. Their governments want to be able to provide those resources for them, want to make sure that their goods can go to market so that infrastructure is available. So I would even go further, Raj, and say, it's not bouncing back, it's bouncing forward. What is the opportunity that this crisis presents for the world to focus on these places where no one understands fully? Well, we've seen a little bit from our own experiences of what they experienced, but this is the life that some of them have lived since they were born. Thank yeah, you. You, you say it so well, and it's it's true. In fact, I'd add one more thing to your list, which is not only the food and the shelter and the medicine, but a path forward in life, a sense that there is some plan or some path or some way to have mobility in life and to grow your, your individual, your, your family, your society. And the big question is, is that in front of us now? We have the sustainable development goals. 
Um, we've slipped dramatically on them due to the pandemic. The UNDP's latest report says we could have over a billion people in extreme poverty by the end of this decade, um, which is, you know, extreme poverty, the, the definition where you used to work it's, the World Bank. It's less than $1.90 a day. A day. Yes. It's an arbitrary figure, but basically it means, you know, you are in an extreme state. And there are many people right above that number as well. So, uh, the, the circumstances that you, Peter, know so well in the countries where you I, and IRC, ICRC work are pretty dire. Um, and, and yet, I think, as Runa mentioned, the, the global conversation is still quite insular. As Borges said, it's about vaccines for my country, my society. How are you seeing this evolve? What do you, what do you see as the big picture opportunity to bounce forward? Uh, well, uh, let me just uh, really emphasize what... Uh, Aruma just has, has mentioned. I think uh, uh, having noticed over the last couple of years the uh, enormous fragilities spreading, uh, there is actually no reset. There is only an option of bouncing forward and leapfrogging. And the question is a little bit how we do it. And, I think there are two basic approaches which uh, may be interested, uh, interesting to bring in. I think increasingly when talking to populations affected by these enormous fragility, which came from war, climate change, underdevelopment, uh, you name it. When we look at these enormous fragilities, I think uh, we recognize that we have to have a much more systematic approach to resilience building. People want markets, they want jobs, they want income, uh, they want to be able to survive. And this is not an issue of emergency aid. And I think this shift from emergency humanitarian assistance to resilience building is a critical issue. At the ICRC, we have done an exercise over the last year, which is quite interesting. We have defined 16 indicators of what uh, resilience building would mean and what came out of conversations in those societies. And we are looking then to see where are hooks where we can somehow contribute to this resilience building in society. And I think it's an in interesting intellectual exercise, but also an analytical exercise to see where main fragilities are and how we carry forward resilience building. And then at the same time, we tried really to look at concrete examples, how we can somehow hook and link emergency work with more long-term resilience building. Uh, just two, three examples. We have really been impressed how little money it needs to start small businesses. Cash credits to small businesses is an enormous development of resilience in society. So it's a great transporter, uh, which is completely different from traditional humanitarian assistance. Second, just to give you an example, we have been active in uh, Marawi, for instance, in the Philippines, on bringing emergency water systems to people displaced by war. But even before the war ended and even before we had finished constructing our emergency system, we got in contact with the Asian Development Bank. And we said, we will have need somebody to pick up because we can through humanitarian assistance prolong our assistance for the next two decades. And the Asian Development Bank came in and then at the same time as building an emergency operations to give water to displaced populations, we had a massive development actor coming in and picking up and building a system which is, uh, which is much more resilient. And as we speak, there is a meeting going on in Goma, which ICRC has called together with the World Bank in order to create a water system uh, in a city which has been highly fragile because uh, of all the displaced populations uh, uh, in the region. And we have developed an, an economic model which should help us uh, with development agencies, humanitarian agencies, multilateral actors, local actors, 
to really build a system which is much more resilient to change. And I think this is what Aruma really uh, very much, I, I, I fully uh, am on your page of uh, bouncing forward, uh, leapfrogging forward by building resilience. Peter, I'm struck that the two examples you gave were with multilateral development banks partnering with a humanitarian agency like yours, right? And that's a perfect symbol of, I think, where we're going. In fact, I will tweet out uh, when we're done here, a chart I saw recently on an interesting World Bank report looking at opportunities in the country of Fiji and showing that depending on whether you work in health or renewable energy or agriculture, you can assess different interventions that will help you in the short term bouncing back or forward the, the long term. They'll help you on decarbonization and on resilience, right? And that's kind of what we're talking about. How do you do all of those things in a place like the Philippines where you know there's gonna be more weather events with the changing climate? You need that water system for the emergency, but also for the long run. Catherine, let, let me get you into the discussion. Aruma mentioned the tremendous assets in the world held in, in the private sector. You've had an illustrious career in asset management. And there's all this wealth in the world, all these private, he, privately held funds chasing returns that are elusive, at least in the developed world, right? In the, in the advanced economies, negative rates, et cetera. And yet you look at some of these fragile countries, these low-income countries, they seem to have maybe longer term, better growth prospects, but the risks are considered far too high. And so it's hard for them to attract that private capital. What, what are you seeing as opportunities to address this imbalance in our financial system that might get at some of these humanitarian and fragility needs? Well, firstly, Raj, um, I echo everyone's thanks in bringing us together to have this uh, critical conversation. And I, I think that um, the reality is the private sector is not only listening, but they want to get involved. And in many ways, I think we have to believe that good things can come out of bad. And when you look across the world, um, this whole discussion about a great reset and bouncing anywhere just feels a little bit strange given that we're entering perhaps one of the most difficult waves of the pandemic. But I think we have to believe that good can come out of bad. And I think it is our duty, indeed it's our responsibility to step up to the plate. But I think that um, one of the challenges has been that historically, the domain of humanitarian and resilience investing, I mean, A, this is a completely new terminology for most people in finance. But secondly, it has been very much the domain of the aid agencies of, of the multilateral development banks. And you're right in saying that, yes, there are these volumes of private sector funds looking for a home and looking for a return. But it's been quite difficult to make that connection historically. And I mean, I think that, I mean, you, you literally would have been living under a stone for a long time if you hadn't realized that the whole world is now woken up to this area of environmental, social and governance investing. There are just waves of assets flowing into this. And I think the critical um, piece for me is that I think the private sector understands that the best way to tackle this effective sort of gap in aid funding is to step in and support. So the reality is that the humanitarian aid budget for COVID is estimated at around, I believe, $39 billion plus plus. And at the end of November, the figures raised largely by the aid agencies uh, and appeals was around sort of 17 billion. So there's a big funding gap. And I think that's an opportunity for the private sector to step in and be counted. Um, I think, you know, that will then uh, lead us to a place where the private sector can participate. I mean, as Peter said eloquently, we can create jobs. You know, jobs give people a purpose. They give people an identity. They give people dignity. And I think sort of long gone are the days where the private sector is just shamelessly looking for profit. Um, I, you know, I can't tell you how many conversations I'm having with people today that they absolutely want this ability to talk about profit, yes, but it's about impact. And I think this is this is the time. And if the finance sector doesn't step up and be counted, I think we will look back and be fundamentally disappointed. So uh, we're all in. Uh, we need to find ways to unlock those collaborations and partnerships. But I think it could be incredibly powerful. Thank you for that. I do want to mention to those who are following, if you're here in the Zoom, you can add questions in the Q&A. We already have a few good, good ones that have come in. If you're following on social, add them in the chat, or you can tweet them at me at Raj underscore DevX, and we'll try to weave them into the discussion as we go here. Um, Borge, I, I want to bring you in uh, around this point Catherine just made about this is the time, this is the moment. 
and, and try to understand from your perspective, you know, you've been a foreign minister, you've, you've worked at a high level in government and the private sector, how you see the moment we're in. You know, we think of the institutions that Arunma and Peter just mentioned, many of them were formed in the aftermath of World War II. Is this a similar moment in your mind? Is this, are we gonna look at this pandemic as a moment when we really fundamentally rethink our structures, our systems, you know, the humanitarian system, the development system, the international organizations, the way we do this kind of work, or is it more about tweaking the model we have today? How do you see it? Well, I, I do hope um, in a post-COVID world that we are able uh, to uh, make some uh, changes and adjustments that are necessary. Let me come back to that. I do uh, agree with all the points um, of Catherine in the, when it comes to the importance of public-private partnerships. Uh, one of the reasons why it's uh, even though more important to mobilize the private sector is also the fact that um, with uh, the trillions of US dollars that are used in stimulus, uh, the fiscal muscle of governments moving forward are more limited. There, there, there is not gonna be that much money around that uh, governments can use because uh, sooner or later, you, you will have to deal with the higher interest rates, but also the fact that uh, you have done what you have done. I do agree though, just to underline that with the strategy that we have uh, followed, I think it was, and still is a much bigger risk to do too little than too much. Um, but uh, we will come to a situation where we will need then to mobilize uh, the private sector to reach the sustainable development goals, but also uh, in other areas. We also need the business models sometimes from the private sector. We can learn from them when it comes to efficiency and how to reach out. I would say that uh, we should use uh, the stimulus and also what the private sector can contribute uh, with in a very smart and strategic way. So we can probably now move more from uh, consumption uh, to investments and we should uh, invest in the green transition that creates more jobs. Three times as many jobs are created if you do something in renewable and tra traditional energy. And the cost of inaction far exceeds the cost of action when it comes to dealing with uh, mitigation, adaptation, and financing uh, on the climate side. That we, uh, in a way, uh, too frequently forget. My Second point is the digital trans, um, transformation. And here I have a big, big concern. Um, if we are gonna give uh, all the children in the world uh, some real opportunities, we cannot accept or live with a situation where 3.6 billion people on our planet, more than half of us are not connected to the internet. How can you then flourish and develop and have equal opportunities if you don't even have access to areas uh, uh, where you know that the growth will come? Look at e-commerce, uh, look also at access to education. We know that we can be faced now with a revolution when it comes to access to great teachers and education. But if you're based in Nigeria and Butcha and you're poor, but you don't even have access to internet, how can you then uh, tune into Harvard's free uh, lessons or Yale's or whatever? This could possibly be a way where we could like really make uh, access to top thinkers and top teachers to also uh, poor children in the world, and then they don't have access. So I think we really, really now need to mobilize the private sector. And there's many tech companies that could support her. And I think they have a bit of leverage too, uh, together with governments. And let's say that in a few years, all children of the world should be connected to the internet, because without that, no one can live for it. Absolutely. I see you nodding, Arunma. Maybe, maybe it's partly because Borges should have mentioned students taking Oxford classes when they get that, when they get that connectivity. I, I, I do want to say, I, think, I, know I have a connection to Harvard as well. So <laughs> you know, I was just bubbling to respond because I think Borger is onto something. It has to be a human right that everyone is connected to the internet. I mean, you, you, you're basically, you don't exist today if you're not connected to the internet. So 
you've got my vote, if my vote means anything. But I just wanted to say, uh, Raj, more generally, there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from the past. Uh, I'm obviously biased. I spent 20 years of my 35 year career working in development banking, but there are examples of how development banks have leveraged the private sector. I mean, when in 2017, the paid in capital of the World Bank, IFC and IBRD put together was less than $20 billion and they'd done $1 trillion. I mean, that is the greatest leverage that an investment bank uh, can have. I was on the board of uh, the, the pioneer board of the International Financing Facility for Immunization. Uh, for those who are not aware, the International Financing Facility for Immunization was birthed out of a proposal that the UK government made to try and see how you can take pledges made by governments over long periods of time and front load it, go to the capital markets, raise money from the capital markets today on the back of pledges over a 25 year period. That has allowed the world to provide about $6.5 billion of funds from the capital markets to vaccinations. So this it's, is a health the financing in mechanism of Gavi, basically. Yeah, so, so, we, so we, we have examples. We need to scale those examples. We need to replicate those examples. We need a sense of urgency that Boger uh, and, 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 and Catherine have, have highlighted. There are many examples that we can replicate. We need to be serious, in my view. Um, I can give you other examples if you permit me. But, no, and but I, I think I, connectivity, Bor Borga's point about connectivity is a great one because that's one where it's not so much about government spending. There is a robust market around connectivity. There are many players and, and technology companies and telcos. It's more about government creating the regulatory environment, setting the rules of the road and incenting the rollout of connectivity to everyone in the world who needs access to it. So perhaps it can be done without the, the big challenges you rightly mentioned, Borge, around, around uh, fiscal deficits in many advanced economies. Catherine, jump in. Um, thank you, Raj. I was just really wanting to build on the points about education and the point that um, small steps can make a big difference because sometimes um, humanitarian resilience um, investing um, can take, um, you know, small steps forward, but for the individual concerned, will just have a life-changing difference. What do I mean by that? So sometimes resilience sits right under your nose. So, you know, school children in London during the pandemic have been massively at a disadvantage because so many of them have just simply not get ac got access to basic technology. No laptops to have remote schooling, you know, no ability to have their own sort of, uh, you know, dignity to have their own identity. So one of the things that at GIB we decided to do, you know, right at the beginning was we reached out to two underprivileged schools very close to us in London and we said, what do you need? How can we help you? And they said, what we really need is we need computers. We need notebooks. We need laptops. And so that's what we did. We supported two schools and we basically reached out. And within a very short space of time, they had the laptops to get the children online to the point that Borgay was making. You've got to give people access to a basic education so that they can improve themselves. And I think the point is sometimes people just think it's so hard. What does this mean? But actually, that's what I, I, I'm really trying to get to a small step, big difference. And I hope those children, you know, go on and achieve great things. Sorry, Peter. No, no, that was great, Catherine. Go ahead, Peter, jump in. You know, I, uh, I fully share, of course, uh, as well the views uh, expressed by Borge and others now in the conversation. But I wanted to go back to an important point uh, Catherine made uh, in her introductory statement, and it's kind of uh, to bring the private, uh, about bringing the private sector along. I think uh, we we have tried over the last uh, couple of years to find the right pathway to bring the private sector uh, uh, around. And there is one issue we have not yet satisfactorily solved. It is solvable, but uh, we are not there yet. And this is really risk sharing arrangements when we talk about private sector investments in highly fragile contexts. I think you know the figures. Uh, 20 contexts in the world are at the origin of 80% of irregular uh, displacements of populations are at the origin of most of the overproportioned increases of humanitarian budgets. And we won't be able to stabilize this situation by just 
transferring and increasing humanitarian development money. We'll have to shift to investment. And if we shift to investment logic, we need de-risking schemes. And here states and multilateral financial institutions come in. And we see that today, neither states nor multilateral financial institutions have all the tools to de-risk so that private sector investments become important. It's happening in sort of middle income countries, and that's good, but it's not happening in the most fragile contexts, which are at the origin of most of the problems that we are looking at. So I just wanted to highlight that this seems to me a crux, still a nut to crack uh, in order to really get to scale with some of the great uh, models that we have tried from humanitarian impact bonds to uh, advanced financing schemes to a lot of other things, which in, in terms of modeling, uh, we know what to do, but in terms of realizing scaling and speeding, we are not there yet. Peter, maybe we can just double click on that for a second because we had a question that came in, someone saying, we've been talking about this private sector investment side of development for a long time. There's real urgency now, we're in a crisis. Is there a way to move this faster, to scale it up? So that the issue you bring up as the main blocking point, do you think this is the moment when something can be done on these de-risking strategies in fragile countries? Is it a question of political will? Is it financial resources on the part of the MDBs or, or bilateral aid agencies? What, what is it that we need to do to actually get this to happen quickly? Well, I think in order to happen it uh, quickly, we need political decisions in multilaterally financial institutions as well as in, in countries. And at the present moment, legal frameworks which would allow states to de-risk private investments in fragile contexts are simply not existing. There are just one or two countries in the world who are able to leverage, for instance, development assistance towards uh, a, a sort of de-risking private sector investments. And I think this is where politically there is a huge opportunity to do it at the right time uh, in order to really be able to speed and scale. Arun, I see you nodding along. Do you, do you want to jump in on this point? I, I was going to say that uh, I think we can take a value chain approach uh, and have everybody at the table. And as I said, look back on the examples that we've had. Um, when IFM, uh, the International Financing Facility for Immunization was founded, there were a few um, countries that wanted to participate uh, uh, between 2003 and 2006. They couldn't because of some of the legal issues. Some of them have subsequently come on board. So Peter's point around taking a crack of um, some of these barriers that are affecting issues around scale. The second thing for me that's an important change is, is really, you know, uh, Catherine made the point earlier, the private sector is much more on board than, than we've ever seen. Uh, Professor Colin Ma, uh, here at um, Sai Business School, University of Oxford, you know, in my view is the next Milton Friedman because on the birthday of um, the article that um, uh, Milton Friedman wrote uh, uh, 50 years ago last year in September, uh, he basically wrote about, you know, what is the purpose of a corporation? The purpose of a corporation is to profitably find business solutions uh, to challenges uh, and 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 you know if there's so much money that's available and we're not deploying that money to to solve the world's greatest challenges then we need to ask ourselves questions about what we're doing uh, here on earth uh, but 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 there are very specific examples so um, in 2017 uh, as part of the um, of the um, the funding round for the International Development Association. The, uh, the arm of the, of the World Bank that provides funding to uh, the poorest countries and fragile and conflict uh, affected countries. Um, there was a decision made by the leadership, pushed by the shareholders, I would say, to make sure that there was a focus on private sector because of the points that have been made on this panel about the private sector. And that birthed uh, an initiative that from uh, 2017 uh, to 2025, uh, there will be funding available for small and medium scale enterprises. Peter, you mentioned uh, in infrastructure for climate, 
uh, in the areas that are critical to restoring normalcy in fragile and conflict affected areas. Because the challenge is that if you don't do something quickly and that is at scale, people will go back into war. This year is 30, 30 years since Somalia has been in war, 30 years. So you can imagine the human cost uh, in, in that respect. So there are many other examples. Um, I, I think um, uh, Boga was the one who mentioned the Philippines. Somebody mentioned the Philippines. The, the World Bank Treasury has had a program to be the intermediary on disaster risk management and has issued a number of disaster risk bonds on behalf of a number of countries around the world, both middle-income countries and fragile countries, and Philippines is one of them. Uh, some of the islands uh, are one of them. So we need to we need to sit together and scale some of these structures. And 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 and, the way, and those innovations came from the private sector. They came from investment banks uh, working uh, with the World Bank. I want to just make sure we add the layer of climate to the discussion that we're having. It's coming through in some of the questions. Obviously, the reality of a climate crisis is going to add a new lens to the fragility question, a new lens to the resilience question. I wonder what that means for any of you as you think about this challenge. You know, there's enormous uh, financing interest in climate, in renewable energy, in green bonds. Does that help us to unlock an opportunity here in terms of financing these big resilience challenges in low income and fragile countries. And what do you think about that? Catherine, go ahead. Uh, well, absolutely, I think is the short answer. Um, but uh, the overlap between areas um, suffering from fragility and conflict and violence can often be so much worse because of uh, climate issues, right? Um, so I think that my great hope was that people wouldn't get effectively sort of sideswiped by the climate debate and forget about the importance of humanitarian and resilience building. But it's all about resilience, whether it's sort of tackling climate related issues or whether it's tackling fragility and conflict issues, it's all about resilience. And I think just coming back to the point that, that Peter was making, you know, what is it that is being this sort of roadblock to get the private sector to really step up? And I think in part, it is, yes, it's an element of political will, we need that, but it's an also, uh, it, we need strong leadership from the, corporate se from the corporate sector too. And I think this has not been uh, an area that many business leaders have necessarily wanted to veer into. It's, you know, they've sort of believed that there's a perception that it's perhaps the domain of others. But as you said, this overlap with climate, if we don't build greater resilience across the world, we will have, you know, an unending sea of pandemics. We will have rising sea levels. We will have displaced people. We will have lack of clean water, poor sanitation. I don't think any of us want that to happen on our watch. And do we honestly want to sit in front of our children and say, I didn't do my part? Um, you know, I definitely don't want to be one of those people. Yeah, and I think I hear this a lot in, in Davos, for example, in prior years that, uh, you know, leadership in the short run is what's needed. And otherwise you get real accountability in the long run, right? These are, these are going to be problems that actually imperil countries, that imperil major corporations if they don't do something soon. It might seem like it's someone else's issue, but it really is their issue as well. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, just a, a very short point to emphasize what uh, Catherine has said. Obviously, in the context in which we work, we see the convergence of climate change, violence, conflict, underdevelopment, uh, uh, health sector issues, everything uh, so contributing to fragility. What is the great thing uh, with regard to looking at climate and climate action as an entry point into resilience building is at the end of the day, that a lot of action is measurable with regard to climate change. And measurability at the end of the day facilitates and accelerates uh, capital investment in those issues. There are other uh, issues in societies which are more difficult to measure, but water, climate change uh, are, archetypical issues which are measurable and therefore you can build financial instruments at large scale around them. And I think that's where we see climate action as an opportunity also to bring a different lens to some of the fragile, violent, struck contexts in which we are operating. 
we're getting near the end of our time here together. And I feel like there's still so much more we can get into. I'll just give you a sense of some of the comments and ideas people are sharing. Their, their comments and questions around tourism. It's such a huge part of the economy for many of these low-income countries that has been completely decimated due to the pandemic. And it's not clear exactly when it's going to come back, especially given the uneven vaccine rollout. There are questions about how we ensure workers' rights as we think about private sector investment in many of these economies. Uh, there are questions about how we can ensure small businesses, local entrepreneurs get access to this financing and it's not stuck at the kind of global corporate or MDB level, the multilateral development bank level. Lots of great thoughts coming from, from people on the Zoom and, and on social media. Um, I, I just invite you as we kind of come to a close here to pick up any of those or any other threads that you'd like to, to help us think through where we go from here. And I'll just share my own, my own view, my own thought. Um, during the pandemic, I didn't know really what to do. So I started doing lots of interviews with senior leaders in development and humanitarian work around the world and streaming them live on social media. And I was just impressed by uh, the, the need for ambition here, right? Uh, Borge, you've talked about the trillions being spent in, in some places. Uh, it seems to me there's a moment or an opportunity for big ambition. We're hearing some of that from some of you, but I'd like as we close just to get your sense of where we go from here. What are the, what are the big things you'd like to see happen from here? Um, maybe Borge, do you want to begin? Thank you so much. Now, this has been a very uh, rich uh, discussion, uh, very uh, impactful. I would say uh, at the end, it's very important also to uh, look at uh, the light uh, that we're seeing now uh, at the end of the tunnel. And so much positive uh, is also happening, especially on the technology side that can be very helpful in the future development and securing a more sustainable planet. For example, look at solar. In 10 years, the price has fallen to one tenth in 10 years. So in many countries now around the world, solar is cheaper than all other kinds of electricity. But what is um, so challenging with all uh, the topics we touched on is that there are so many dilemmas and it's really about squaring the circle all the time. If you look at the energy field and climate change and meeting the SDGs. So there's still 1.4 billion people on our planet that don't have even access to basic electricity. So how can you decouple the growth? Because these people really need access to electricity. How can you decouple that from growth in CO2? How can you make sure that we also will have the right financing for adaptation? Because regardless of how successful we are on the mitigation side in the years to come, there will be changes in the climate and the most vulnerable are the poor and the poor of the poor. But financing of the adaptation is almost not existing. And this is not the most juicy part of finance. So how do we mobilize money there when we know that $1 spend on adaptation really, really pays off because that's securing livelihoods and it's, uh, you know, the cost is much lesser, uh, much uh, lower than the investments. While we're be speaking here, I just saw on the news that uh, GM has now announced that by 20, so I get it right, by 2035, they will stop producing vehicles that run on fossil fuel. So what we're seeing now, and this is like a big revolution, I would say, companies are running faster when it comes to climate change and energy than governments. They're competing in becoming climate neutral and we have CEOs, action groups for uh, going climate neutral. And this is something new, very, very powerful. So this we have to build on. But of course, one of the dilemmas that we have to look at, and this was also touched on by Peter, how do we also get the private sector interested and investing in the most fragile among the fragile. Because if uh, you go from being fragile to a failed country, then you're really, really in deep trouble. How do you de-risk these kind of investments? And there it's a separate discussion, but there are things that I would like always ICRC and Peter to do if it's like immediate humanitarian assistance. That's Fair, but down the line, you need to start to reinvest in livelihood early, um, building back and building back better. There, I think the private sector can play much more role. And I think companies are willing to take it on. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that, Borg. And, and I agree with you. There's the elements are here. The ingredients are here. It's how we bake this cake together now, right? In this moment, uh, we've run basically out of time, but I want a very brief comment from, from each of the rest of you, if you can, as we, as we close. Uh, Arunma, please. Uh, th uh, thank you, um, um, uh, Raj. And uh, I couldn't thank you and uh, Wef uh, um, more than... I have for this opportunity uh, to discuss this issue. Um, I think we need a systematic approach. I mean, uh, Borga was talking about some of the statistics he's looking at. You know, I was shocked when FAO brought out its report that said that food waste, uh, if it was a country, would be the third largest emitter uh, of greenhouse um, gas emissions. Yet 800 million people go to bed hungry. Uh, it's $750 billion annually that we're losing in food waste. That needs to be fixed. Um, so it's, it's really having a systematic approach. It's also having an inclusive approach. Uh, and we can leverage technology to reach the small and medium scale enterprises and provide them um, loans that can, make the, that can allow them to scale. Uh, it's also execution. Uh, you know, talk is cheap. We need to take action. Uh, Catherine had said, you know, our children will ask us questions. So systematic approach, inclusive approaches, and taking action are the three uh, words that I would use. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, C Catherine, some final thoughts from you very briefly, and then Peter, and then we, we need to close. Sure. So very briefly, building on the conversation, I, I think it is about action. Uh, we've had enough talk. Um, we've got to get on it. It's just the same as the climate emergency. Uh, we're delighted at GIB to be working in partnership with Peter and with Borge on a humanitarian uh, resilience uh, program where we are looking at building better data. And that's exactly what will unlock the private sector interest because there's just not enough of it. We need to unpick those data, uh, those data sort of bottlenecks. And we'll shortly be releasing a white paper. Um, so we'll be able to share that. But it's been a fantastic project. But step up to the plate and join us. It's about partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Peter. Um, not much to add. When I look at what we have discussed, we have discussed a lot of hardware today, organizations, finance, digital, private sector. Uh, I think uh, I scrolled through some of the questions and I wanted to highlight the importance at the basis to build trust in communities and trustful relations with communities uh, in the most fragile context in order to really land our efforts uh, on fruitful soil. And that's more of a software approach, which at the end of this conversation, I wanted to, uh, to bring in. It's important not to forget this dimension as uh, I join Catherine in the call uh, for action and not for words. Thank you for that, Peter. Yeah, I think of software and I think of the, I mean, just the reality, the, in, the inequalities in the world, the dramatic inequalities within societies, between countries, as Arunma so eloquently pointed out, people are hungry while we're wasting food. You know, the, the, the need for accountability against these challenges, especially around climate, right? This is gonna hit all of us in a very direct and visceral, visceral way, just as the pandemic has. So I, I thank all of you. It's been a dr dramatically uh, interesting conversation, very much like a Davos conversation, as though we were there in Switzerland. I always walk out of these sessions kind of thinking, thinking different thoughts and asking myself uh, deeper questions. And that certainly happened here today. So I really appreciate all of you. I appreciate the folks who've joined us from all over the world, the great questions and comments we've had come through. Um, my thanks again to the World Economic Forum, and I wish all of you a great Davos Agenda week. Be well, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.